Hi everybody. In today's lecture, um, I want to talk about heat capacities for solids and liquids. We'll have a separate lecture for heat capacities of ideal gases. So let's first define what a heat capacity is. A heat capacity, usually symbolized by a capital C in most texts, um, for a sample is the amount of energy needed to raise the temperature of that sample by one degree Celsius. Now remember that when you convert from Celsius to Kelvin, you're just adding or subtracting 273 depending on which way you're going. So it only differs by an additive constant, so that means that the degrees are the same size. So if you're changing a temperature, if you have a delta T, then it's equivalent to have that delta T in either Celsius or Kelvin because they're the same size. Okay. So I might do that interchangeably in the next uh, lecture or two on this subject. Um, don't freak out. So if we define the heat capacity C as the amount needed to raise the temperature of the sam sample by 1 degree C or Kelvin, then we can define the amount of energy Q, heat energy, that needs to be transferred to or from a substance to change that temperature by 1 degree Celsius. The equation is Q is equal to C times delta T, okay? Now that Q with the big C, that one has um, the mass kind of buried within it. We all understand, I think, conceptually, that it takes more energy to heat up, say, a thousand kilograms of lead than it does to heat up one kilogram of lead by one degree C, right? The more massive substance will have a higher heat capacity. So to get around that and be able to tabulate what amount of energy it might take and estimate what amount of energy it might take to change the temperature of a substance, we instead discuss the specific heat capacity. The specific heat capacity is usually symbolized by a lowercase c in most texts. And this is the heat capacity big C per unit mass. So it's normalized for the amount of the substance. If we still say that it takes some energy big Q, some amount of heat energy big Q, transferred to or, sub, uh, to or from a, surface, a substance that has a mass M and causing a temperature change delta T, then the specific heat little c is equal to Q divided by M delta T. Okay? Now, in this lecture, I'm focusing on the heat capacity um, for solids and liquids. Most of the time, most of the work is done there in uh, heat capacity per unit mass, okay, or joules per kilogram per degree Celsius. Um, for gases, they usually use the idea of a molar heat capacity, which is amount of energy per unit mole per temperature change. So the SI units are usually joules per mole per Kelvin, okay? We're going to talk about ideal gases in a separate lecture, though, and so in this one we're going to talk about just solids and liquids. So it'll be joule per kilogram per degree C. So I like to think of this specific heat as kind of a heat inertia, if you will. The specific heat is how much uh, a substance resists a change in temperature, okay? Um, or how thermally insensitive it is. That's another way to put it. If something has a high specific heat, then that means that it causes more energy, takes more energy to change the temperature of that substance than it does something with a lower specific heat, that same temperature change, okay? Now remember, the equation that we're going to be using for um, the amount of heat that it takes to change the temperature of something is Q is equal to MC delta T, right? Where little c is the specific heat. Here's some specific heat for some common uh, metals shown here. This is just to give you a ballpark idea of what some of these values might be. So on this list, lead has a pretty low specific heat for, compared to other metals, 128 joules per kilogram per degree Celsius. Whereas, you know, the highest one on this list is beryllium, 1,830 joules per kilogram per degree Celsius. Okay, so those are some specific heat for common metals. Now, water has a really high specific heat compared to most substances. It's a really interesting substance, actually, from a lot of standpoints. It also has a relatively high density compared to most liquids. So the specific heat of water is 4,186 joules per kilogram per degree Kelvin. 
that's about, you know, 10 times higher than most metals, as we saw from that uh, slide previously. Now, this high specific heat combined with the high density is responsible for a lot of weather phenomena. Of course, our planet is about 70% water, right? And so uh, this high specific heat dictates a lot of the weather that we see. Specifically, you've probably noticed that if you've ever been uh, to the seaside, that you'll find more moderate temperatures and weather at the seaside or near another la large body of water than you will inland. It's also responsible for a lot of our global wind systems, this temperature gradient uh, from the shore to the, uh, to the inland causes a lot of you know, pressure differences for global wind systems, and those land and sea breezes that are so pleasant when you're sitting right next to the ocean. So in order to put some numbers to this, um, to make this a little bit more concrete for you, I thought I'd do an example problem here. So, as I said, the air temperature around coastal areas is very influenced by this high specific heat of water, which yet again, 4,186 joules per kilogram per Kelvin. Water also has a high density, 1,000 kilograms per meter cube, roughly, right? So, what happens is, if you have a relatively small volume of water, say one cubic meter of seawater, then that amount of water, say if it loses one degree C, can actually heat up a very large volume of air. So in this example problem, I wanted to show you what volume of air that a uh, one meter cubed sample of water could heat by one degree C if the water loses one degree C, okay? So in this scenario, the water is giving up its heat to the air and it's a direct transfer from water to air, okay? So we're looking at one cubic meter of water. Since the density of water is 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed, then the mass of water for one cubic meter would be 1,000 kilograms. So remembering our equation, mc delta t, here both of the temperature changes are one. So the water is losing that one degree and the air is gaining it, okay? So now we're just going to find first what mass of air would be heated by the loss of 1,000 kilograms or one cubic meter of water. So we're setting these Q is equal to MC delta T is equal to one another. The delta T's are the same magnitude, so they cancel out, okay? So now if we put the water on the left-hand side, one cubic of meter of water is 1,000 kilograms. The specific heat of water is 4,186 joules per kilogram per Kelvin, okay? So now let's look at the right-hand side. Let's look at the air. Okay. The specific heat of air is about 1,000 joules per kilogram per Kelvin, and the density of air is about 1.3 kilograms per meter cubed. We're just going for ballpark figures here. Of course, it will change if the temperature changes and all kinds of stuff like that, so this is just a ballpark. So on the right-hand side, we have M, the mass of air that we're solving for, times the specific heat, 1,000 joules per kilogram per Kelvin. We set that equal to the stuff for the water on the left-hand side. Now we solve for M. Well, it turns out that the mass of the air that is heated by one degree when the water loses one degree is 4,186 kilograms. Well, that's a lot, right? And that's because the specific heat of water is so much larger than that of air, right? Now, what volume of air is that? Because water is also extremely dense, right? So given that the density of air is so much lower, right? Rho, the, vol uh, the density, is 1.3 kilograms per meter cubed for air. That's equal to the mass divided by the volume of air that that would be. So if we have 4,186 kilograms divided by the volume, set that equal to 1.3 kilograms, what volume do we get? Well, that's 3,220 cubic meters. So one cubic meter of water can heat up over 3,000 cubic meters of air. And this is one of the main reasons that temperatures, weather, is so moderate right next to the seashore. I hope that's clear. I hope it makes sense. And I hope this simple example introduced you to some of the ideas for um, heat capacities and specific heats. I'll see you in class.